today's guest is an American author and podcaster. Although he is primarily known for writing horror, he has also written many other genres, which include dark fantasy, crime fiction, comic books, and even westerns. He has written over 50 books, which include The Rising, City of the Dead, Clickers, Gathering of the Crows, Dark Howl, Ghost Walk, Castaways, and Urban Gothic, just to name a few. A few of his stories have been adapted for the screen. They include Ghoul, The Naughty List, The Ties of Bind, and Fast Zombie Suck, which I agree with. His novel Terminal was turned into a stage play. Please welcome to the Claws Corner, two-time Bram, Sto Bram Stoker Award winner and the winner of the 2014 World Horror Grandmaster Award, Mr. Brian Keene. Wow. You like that? You make me sound good, brother. <laughs> you really have to do a lot of work. <laughs> Your work speaks for itself. <laughs> I am a huge fan of yours. Thank you very much for being on the show. Hey, it's I've my pleasure. So let's get right to it. Okay. Let's begin with your podcast, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. What made you decide to end the show after six and a half years and nearly 300 episodes? Am I allowed to curse on your show? Go right ahead. It was too much bullshit. <laughs> I mean, th this is video, so I, I can show you. You know, I, those shelves right there, that's, that's why I got into this business. I got into this business to be a writer. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what I always wanted to be. And, you know, the podcast was fun. It was rewarding. I think uh, it was important for our genre from a historical perspective. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of our genre. I, I came into this a fan. If I was canceled tomorrow, I would still be a fan. Um, you know, so I, I think it was important for our genre. But after six and a half years, it's time for other people to to step up and fill that role. I just, I just, I don't have time for it anymore. Um, you know, it ostensibly on the surface, it looks like, uh, you know, we reported on a news story and a, a very small vocal group of people just trolled us and trolled people involved in the news story endlessly. Uh, I say ostensibly that's what it looks like on the surface, but the, the truth of the matter is, their their little campaign was the final kick in the ass I needed to just say you know what this isn't worth it anymore. Uh, I had I had been thinking it for the last year. When we started the podcast six and a half years ago, we spent one day a week on the podcast. The rest of the week I would write. Second year it was two days a week on the podcast. This year there were many times where I spent an entire week just on the podcast and, and didn't get a thing written. And uh, so, you know, the, this, this final brouhaha was, it was really a blessing in disguise because it allowed me to finally pull the plug. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I really did love the show like so many people did. And what I love most about your podcast is that you explore the bad, like we talked about, you always fight for the little guy and you're always promoting other horror authors. There's, it doesn't seem like there's really a lot of competition with you. You're always there saying, this guy's a great author, you should check out his books. And I love that about you because you expose so many authors to me, myself personally, and I can name three of them right off the bat. Paul Tremblay, Dan Padavona, and Jeff Strand. Two of them I had on my podcast and my other show. And uh, Paul said he'd do the show, but because of you, I've gone to, on you know Amazon or bookstores, Barnes Noble when they were open and said, you know what? I like this guy. I like him on the show. Let me check and see what he has to write. And I am a huge fan of so many new authors because of you. So thank you. Yeah, I don't, you know, I've had people say to me, um, you know, back, back when you and I were young, young and, and reading hard, just discovering the genre, yeah. there were always those, those three authors that if, if an editor sold an anthology, they, they either had to have Stephen King, Clive Barker, or Robert R. McCammon. Um, and I've been told by editors many times that, you know, the three names now are Joe Hill, Jonathan Mayberry, or myself. If you want to sell an anthology, you got to have one of us. And, you know, people have asked me, you know, is there, is there competition between Joe Hill and myself? Is there competition between Mayberry and I? And, and no, there's not. And I, I know that they would tell you the same thing. Uh, you know, they're both dear friends. I love them both. They're good guys. I don't believe in competition. Um, I think healthy, a little bit of healthy competition is, is good yeah. no matter what your vocation. But, uh, you know, writing hard, particularly 
we're the genre that gets looked down on by everybody else in publishing, you know? Um, so I, I, I've always seen us as sort of a tribe, sort of a family. And, you know, if, if you choose to write horror rather than, you know, romance or literary criticism or nonfiction or, you know, Westerns or anything else, if you choose to write horror, then I think you're a member of that tribe and, and you should be welcomed. Unless you're an asshole, of course. But, uh, <laughs> Which you know, I love. So, you always expose the assholes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I enjoy introducing authors who, who I think should have a, a wider audience. I enjoy introducing to that audience. You know, I've been lucky enough and privileged enough to have a pretty loud bullhorn, a pretty large platform. Um, and I'm not doing anything that writers didn't do for me back in the day. You know, Richard Lehman, uh, you know, Jack Ketchum. I, I don't want to sit here and list names because we'd be here all day, but, but so many authors who I looked up to, who I read as a young person. I mean, everybody from the Splatterpunks to Stephen King himself, they've always been gracious to me and kind to me. And, uh, you know, I, I want to do the same thing for the people coming up behind me. Always have. You know, and sometimes that probably bites me in the ass, but I don't care. I'm going to keep doing it. I love that attitude. I always said you're extremely talented and brutally honest. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I loved how you described your show because I think it's a perfect way to describe the horror show. It was part Howard Stern, part inside the actor studio. Yeah. Because you, you're a great writer, but you're also a great interviewer. And one of the interviews that comes to mind right away is Jack Ketchum. I learned so much about that. I met him at least three or four times at Rock and Shock in Worcester, Mass. Never knew any of the stuff. And then I listened to your interview. I'm like, wow, he did so much before he oh, was yeah. writing. And so I just love the fact that I, how you described the show, because it is part Howard Stern, part inside the actor studio. And I agree with you. I'm so glad that you're going to be concentrating on writing because, you know, that's your, what you're known for and that's what you do best. But I am definitely going to miss you on the air. Well, I, you know, I, I should stress, I'm not completely going away. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I like promoting authors and I like talking to authors who I look up to. Yeah. Uh, like one of the very last interviews we did on the show was Brian Hodge. It took me six and a half years to work up the nerve to actually interview him because uh, the guy intimidates me in the best way. He's one of my favorite writers. Um, I, I want to continue to do that. Just not on this weekly basis where it, it impacts my writing and, and not in a way that creates controversy. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I've got a YouTube channel like everybody and just occasionally when the mood strikes, you know, maybe once a month, I'm going to, I'm going to hop on there and I'm going to have a conversation with another writer. Uh, David J. Scow, one of those writers who I look up to and another one of those writers who, like I said earlier, has been so gracious and helpful to me. He's going to be the first guest. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just going to be like what you and I are doing now. Um, and got some other great people, uh, Stephen Graham Jones, Gabino Iglesias, Cena Paleo, Tim Wagoner. Um, you know, but again, it, there's no schedule. It's just when, when I finally have the time, hey, let's hop on YouTube tonight and, and do this interview. Yeah, this is no longer an obligation. Now it's just doing it for fun, like what it was originally started out to be. Exactly. So are you going to be continuing with your, with your other podcast, Defenders of Dialogue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Defenders Dialogue, you know, that was something. You know, I, I mean, talk about the history of this genre. J.F. Gonzalez, you know, the, the author J.F. Gonzalez was my absolute best friend. And uh, if I didn't talk to him at least once a day, it was a, it was a crappy day. Um, you know, when he died and, and Tom Piccarelli died, Christopher Golden, who I had always been very close with, but Christopher Golden has kind of become that new best friend, where if I don't talk to him at least once a day, it's a crappy day. And Chris will probably tell you the same thing. And, uh, you know, it, it's Defender's Dialogue is just a way for Chris and I to escape from all the bullshit in our lives, professionally and personally, once a week, it's two best friends talking about comic books. And uh, yeah, there's no way in hell I'd stop that. It's, it's never made a dime. Um, I mean, we've sold ads on that podcast, but all it did was pay for production costs. Uh, yeah. and, we, and we don't want it to make a dime. We, we do that show 
because we love it because it brings us joy and because apparently people like listening to us talk about comic books so now a third project not even get to the writing yet is <laughs> brian <laughs> keen radio is that going to well, be continuing or is that well over? that i pulled the plug on that uh you know that was that was costing me upwards of 400 dollars a month yeah. um yeah. which the horror show could pay for you know it, the horror show pulled in enough in advertising that it, it paid for that but with no horror show left, um, I, I can't see keeping alive what was truthfully just a vanity project for myself. You know, I, I love radio. Um, I was always enamored with the idea that, that Stephen King took a royalty check and bought this AM radio station in Maine because um, he wanted something to listen to while he wrote. I'm the same way. I, I always have music on in the background while I'm writing. And... Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to buy an AM FM station because, you know, I, I, my royalty checks aren't enough to do that. But, <laughs> but you know, internet radio is a thing. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to launch this internet radio station and it's going to play music and, it, you know, uh, I can I can play the, stream the podcasts on there as well. And, and I mean, it had listeners, it had an audience, but at the end of the day, it's just something else to take away from writing, you know? Speaking of writing, that was a great segue. <laughs> Let's get into what you're known for. And you originally did not want to become an author. So what did you originally set out to be and what changed your mind? Well, I, always, I always wanted to be an author. Um, but I, I was I was torn. I, I wanted to entertain people. Um, I knew I I knew I wanted to be a either a writer or a disc jockey or an actor. I knew I wanted to be one of those three things. And uh the writing bug came first. I, 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 can, I can vividly remember it. I was eight years old and uh, my dad went down to the, the newsstand to get himself a, a pouch of chewing tobacco and a hunting magazine. And he took me along with him. And, you know, I, I can remember everything. I remember riding in the pickup truck. I remember the country station he had on. I remember the song that was playing. I remember the smell of his chewing tobacco. But what I really remember are the two comic books that he bought me. It was uh, an issue of the Defenders and an issue of Captain America and the Falcon. And I, I read them on the way home, immediately reread them. My mom called me for dinner, went and ate, rushed through dinner, came running back, read those comic books a third time and started looking up the words that I didn't know. And then I noticed on the, the front page, I don't know why I'd missed it the other times, but it, you know, it, it said written by. And it clicked in my eight-year-old head. I'm like, oh, this is a job. Like, like my dad goes to the paper mill every day. Somebody went into an office somewhere and wrote this and got paid. And, and right then, I knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, but, I, you know, as I said, I, I also loved radio. And I yeah. thought maybe I'd be pretty good at that. And, uh, you know, as I got older, got into drama club and things like that, I, I thought, hey, you know, acting or stand up, I might be good at one of those two. Um, I, I've never actually tried my hand at acting outside of high school. That just, that, that went away. Um, I've never really tried my hand at stand up. I have a lot of friends who are stand up comedians who tell me I'd be good at it, but yeah. never tried it. Uh, but I was really good as a disc jockey. Um, and I guess I'm okay as a writer. I mean, I don't think I'm any great shakes as a writer, but a lot of people seem to enjoy the stuff I write. Um, you know, it's provided me with a, a very decent living. So, you know, I, I, I consider myself pretty lucky in that regard. Well, it's funny because I, when I graduated high school, I live in Connecticut. So I went to Connecticut School of Broadcasting, was in radio for a while. Then over the years, I had to get a real job because that wasn't paying the bills radio. No. So... <laughs> I, what I did was I love writing, so I came out and I self-published book, Confessions of a Frenetic Mind. I did stand-up comedy for about four years, played five states, over 400 shows, and I did act in some low-budget movies that were on YouTube and maybe played, like, the big screen on, in festivals. So I got – it's funny. You and I have very, very similar interests, and I had a chance to do on a very small scale. I guess if Howard's the king of all media, I'm the king of no media. <laughs> <laughs> you know, good. <laughs> what I found with radio, I mean, I, I did every shift that you can think of. I, I liked the overnight shift because nobody bothered you. 
Um, That's what I, I did. made okay money in morning drive, but you know where I made the most money in radio? It was right. in the sales department. Yes. <laughs> So which station did you actually work at in the morning drive? Uh, the last one, uh, and I, I wasn't officially morning drive, but because I was the guy that could do the voices, yeah. they would bring me in and I'd get a stipend for the, uh, that was uh, WSOX here in Central PA. Uh, but, you know, over the years, it's, it's like the old, uh, the old sitcom WKRP where they talk about how Johnny has moved from station to station to station. Every DJ you and I both know of a certain age has that history. Oh yeah, you know, it was the same for me. I never moved around the country, uh, but you know, uh, I was I was on the air in in Maryland and here in PA, and you know, um, I mean, I I enjoyed it. I don't know that I would enjoy it today. Uh, no, it's it, not the, the industry has changed. Yeah. Um, you know, I still have a lot of friends in radio and I talk to them and none of them are enjoying it anymore. They're all just waiting to retire. Um, but I enjoyed it at the time. I, I, but I vastly prefer writing. Yeah. Now, what's funny, you, you'll get a kick out of this. The biggest station I worked at was 106.9 or 107 WCCC, which is the station that Howard Stern got to start yeah. at. So I worked there the overnights for about a year or so. And it's just, I was making, this was in 1995, making five bucks an hour. I don't even think that was minimum wage, but they told me, they're like, Hey, if you don't want it. There's a hundred thousand people that are, you know, a hundred people that are going to want it right behind you. So I took it and I had a fun time doing it, but this was 95. I started in radio in 92 and they were telling me back then, they're like, you got into radio at the wrong time. It used to be so much fun. And then more recently I saw some of the same DJs and they're like, boy, or newer DJs, they're like, boy, I wish I was in radio when you were in radio. It seems like it was so much more fun back then. So it's gotten even, it's gotten steadily worse because, you know, pe things like Pandora and satellite radio, people just don't really care about terrestrial radio anymore. But They don't. They don't. And, you know, it's, it's all corporatized now. There's very few privately owned stations anymore. Um, actually, I didn't talk about this publicly, but I got an invite last year to return to radio, um, you know, with the, the – it was, it was, it would have been started out local, but what they'd hoped to do was syndicate it sort of like Alice Cooper's show that he does. Um, and I thought about it. I, I thought about it really hard. Um, but ultimately it's just not an industry I want to get back into. You know, I'll be 53 this week. I, why, why would I want to get back into that now? You know, well, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> From the clause corner. <laughs> Let's talk about your writing. I mean, okay. your first novel, Mr. Rising, was published in 2003, and you are credited with, and I think rightly so, rejuvenating the zombie craze, because after you, all of a sudden, 28 days later comes out, The Walking Dead become, becomes a huge hit. So congratulations on rejuvenating the zombie craze. Thank you. I did not do it alone, though. Um, I mean, you know, hey, look, people want to say that, I'll take it, because it sells books. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a... I'm not a metaphysical guy, but the, the author, Alan Moore, um, he, he has this idea. He says there's this dimension of creative energy that he calls idea space. And he thinks that creators, be they artists, painters, writers, video game designers, whatever, he thinks we subconsciously tap into this. And that explains why all of a sudden you'll see, you know, five giant snake novels in a row come out in a row and like i said i'm not a metaphysical guy but i i have to wonder because you know i started the rising well what would become the rising i started it around 97 98 started writing it um and i know that danny boyle's idea for 28 days later he got it around the same time kurtman got the idea for the walking dead around the same time they all came out within six months of each other um, independently, you know, I certainly didn't know either of them. They didn't know me. And you look at, at them, they all have similarities. Obviously they all upgrade, you know, the, the traditional Romero zombie. Uh, they all have a woman of color as one of the main protagonists. They all have a parent and child dynamic. Um, so it's, it's really weird, but to, to see the splash all three made, you know, the rising, of course, in bookstores, 
uh, Walking Dead in comic book stores and 28 Days Later on the screen. It was, it was seismic. And then a year after all of them came out to see just the, the plethora of stuff that ripped all three of us off. It was, it was amazing to be ripped off that many times. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're the one that came out with it first. So everybody can say, no, nope. it started with Brian Keene. You know, I think the three of you are great. But yeah, I, I know what you're talking about because after that, there's just, it, it's not even good. It's, they don't even try that hard. They're basically like, yeah, all right, let me just rip off what everybody else is doing. I mean, at no. least yours is original. The other two are very original. And thank you very much for starting that. And I always hear Greg Isles and Stephen King talking about how much they hate when people say, hey, where'd you come up with that idea? And normally I hate that question too, but I love this story. Please tell my viewers how you came up with the premise for The Rising. Well, yeah, um, you know, the original novel, it, it was just going to be this guy trapped in this bomb shelter in the zombie apocalypse. And well, he's in there with a bunch of people and they're running out of food and they can go outside and get eaten by the zombies or they can stay inside and eat each other. And, uh, Richard Lehman read the, the early manuscript and he said, no, he says, this doesn't work. Um, the, the guy in the bomb shelter is a great opener, but it needs to be something else. And he was right. Um, so, I, you know, I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it. And uh, at the time, my oldest son, who will actually turn 30 this year. So I, I, I just realized that as you and I are talking, my how time flies. But he lived in New Jersey with his mother. And I was driving from Pennsylvania to New Jersey, and there was a blizzard. And they had declared a state of emergency, and uh, I got pulled over on the turnpike by the National Guard. They flagged me down, and they, they said, sir, have to keep the roadways clear. You need to, you need to get off the road. And I said, absolutely, I'll, I'll pull off up here at the, the rest area. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. Drove away. As soon as they were out of sight, I kept going. And I thought, well, you know, Dudes with machine guns in the middle of a blizzard won't stop me from seeing my son. What would? <laughs> Zombies? No, they wouldn't stop me either, but that's, that's the idea. So I went back home, and uh, I got out the manuscript, and, you know, the, the first chapter started the same, guy in the bomb shelter, but then it's, it becomes guy leaves the bomb shelter to go find his kid in the middle of the zombie apocalypse. I love that story. Now, when you're writing, do you have a writing schedule that you stick to, or do you only write when inspired? No, I, uh, I've been lucky enough to do this full time, meaning this is how I pay the mortgage, pay the grocery bill uh, for, what, almost 20 years now. Um, so I, I treat it like a job because this is, in fact, my job. Um, you know, when I worked in a foundry, uh, I had to make a certain amount of molds every day or I didn't get paid. Um, you know, with writing, I, I have to write a certain amount of words every day or I'm not going to get paid. You know, I'm not going to get the book turned in. So I, uh, it, it, it varies a little bit, um, only because my, my youngest son is doing remote schooling right now in the pandemic. So I have to, have to get him settled in and stuff. But usually I start around 730 in the morning and, uh, I'll go till about three o'clock. And then he's done with schooling and he and I will take a hike through the woods. Um, if I'm under a deadline, I may go back to work that evening, but more often than not, I don't. I just go 7.30 in the morning till three and then I'm done. Have you ever seen the movie Adaptation with uh, Nicolas Cage? Oh yeah. yeah. Have you ever had a day like that where you're just looking at the screen going, what am I gonna write? <laughs> or does it, does it just flow from you? No, it flows. Um, I do get days First of all, I, I should say, I, I don't believe in writer's block. And I, I don't mean that disparagingly. I just, I don't think writer's block is a thing. I think it's, it's something, it's a phrase we've invented to excuse ourselves when we want to go play Xbox or we, we want to take an extra long hike with our kid. We, we oh, we have writer's block. No, you know, you, you can't go to your day job and say, oh, I have waitress block today, you know? Um, it just yeah. doesn't work like that. So, but, but I do believe that you can have those days where you're not feeling creative, where you're just not into it. Yeah. Um, and on those days, I usually, I usually have more than one project going at a time. So, you know, 
if I'm just not into the novel today, I'll switch gears and I'll work on a short story, you know, and then the next day I'll come back to the novel. I belong to a writing group and I can't remember which book. It might've been from Stephen King's book on writing. And it worked for me when I was writing. He said, if you just can't think of anything to write, just write down anything. It could be the stupidest thing. And that could completely change the way the story goes. And you're like, well, I never looked at it that way. And one time I did that and the story I was writing, I said, wow, that, I like this. I like where this is going. I had no idea. And it was, it gotten so deep into it where the character I was writing, I'm like, I can't wait to see what he's going to do next. I mean, that doesn't really happen often, but when I was doing that, I just, do you ever have that where you just say, you know, let me write anything down and that changes the course of the story? Um, I don't know that it happens exactly like that, but I'm, I'm notorious for not plotting my shit out. Uh, you know, I usually have the opening sentence and a vague idea of what I want the plot to be. Um, yeah. But I, I, I very much make it up as I go along. Um, you know, I, I may know point A and point Z, but everything in between. It, and, uh, you know, so I don't just write anything, but there are times where I'll write something and I'll be like, where the hell did this come from? This, yeah. This changes everything. <laughs> like you mentioned City of the Dead. So I'm sure you've read City of the Dead. Yeah. You know, the original, the ending as I saw it all along was uh, Frankie and Danny and a couple other characters would get to a, the airport and this pilot character was going to be alive and they'd all fly off into the sunset. Obviously, none of that happens at the end of that book. It, it's a very grim, very different ending. And uh, that was a case of, you know, just writing and things began to suggest themselves almost automatically. And it's like, oh, okay, this, this is not where I wanted this story to go, but well, let's follow it and see where it goes. Now, on average, how many drafts do you usually do before Three. you're happy? Three? Three, yep. Um, I know writers who do more than that, uh, and that's fine. Everybody's process is different. Uh, you know, just for me as a, I, I know my own insecurities. If, if I don't stop at three, I would do 12 drafts and still not turn the fucking book in. Yeah. Um, so I, I do first draft, I do second draft, then I send it off to pre-readers. I get their input and then their input is incorporated into the final draft. Well, I agree with you because I think it was Greg Isles that said, perfection is the death of good. You're never going to get it perfect. Just write down as good as you can get it and then put it out and move on to the next one. Right. You're always going to be working. Because I, in the writing club, I finished my book two years ago. I went on the last meeting and it's the same people saying, I'm almost done editing. You've been editing for two years. You have to be happy with at least some of it. So I think sometimes a part of it is, I like perfection as a depth of good, but I also I think sometimes they're just afraid to submit it to somebody and say, I really don't like this. That could be it too, but. You have to have a thick skin. I mean, I've well, done comedy, and, radio, and you've done all this stuff too. So you know, you can't take reject rejection personally. Yep. Yeah, well, and you get, you know, there's an economic factor too. Um, you know, if if you if you're still editing draft seven, yeah. you know, seven years later, you're not getting paid. Um, I'll give you a great example. We just finished a book called Suburban Gothic. It's a sequel to my novel Urban Gothic. Um if I didn't get the book turned in by the end of September, um, financially it would impact Thunderstorm Books, who are going to do the hardcover. It would impact their printer. Uh, it would impact the employees at that printer. You know, so there's a there's a whole chain of command of people whose paychecks are going to be directly impacted. If I'm fucking around and don't get the book turned out, <laughs> no, no pressure at all. No yeah, pressure. you know, so it, you know that changes your perspective. I and there are parts of suburban God. Like I was just talking about this with uh, my co-writer Brian Smith. There's there's parts I'd like to go back and expand on things and change things, but we're we're past that point now. It is what it is, you know. Have you ever gotten all the way to almost to the end and said, you know what, I have a better idea and had to start all over again? No, or some, no, you never got that no. far. I mean, I've, I've had that happen, but I, I've never given into it. Um, the only time I came close to that, uh, I was, I was writing a novella, uh, 
for this project that Bev Vincent and I did together. And I was, I was more than three quarters of the way done with the novella. And uh, then Stephen King dropped his new collection just after sunset at the time. And I read the collection. I think it was just after sunset. It was, whichever collection had the, uh, the story N in it. I know what you're talking about. I can't think of what it is right now. And uh, I read N and I'm like, son of a bitch. This is the same plot as this novella I've been writing. I mean, just, just like that in twine. Uh, um, and I'm like, all right, well, I, I can't do this at all. So I, I sat that aside. It's still sitting on my hard drive. Maybe one day I might cannibalize it. But uh, so I had to start a completely different novella from scratch. You know, it's funny. The same thing happened to Stephen King. Um, my mind went blank on the name of the book, but where the, the oh, it's Dome, where the dome forms over the town. Right when that novel came out, or right before, The Simpsons came out with a movie where the dome is over the top. He's like, I did not rip The Simpsons off. I had this, I've been working on this for 20 years. Well, that impacted me too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my novel, A Gathering of Crows, uh, it opens with, uh, was it A Gathering of Crows or was it Darkness in the Edge of Town? I can't remember. One of those two novels, um, this. This, I think it was Gathering of Crows. This carload of kids hits this invisible barrier outside the town. And I turned that novel in to Leisure Books, who was my pu paperback publisher at the time. Yeah. And like four days after I turned it in, Kings Under the Dome came out. And I'm reading it. And there's the scene with the airplane hitting the dome. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> And I knew that, that my novel wasn't going to be out for a year. So people were going to say, oh, he ripped yeah. off Stephen King. Well, then my kid wants to see the Simpsons movie. So we go to see that too. And I'm like, all right, well, we both ripped off the Simpsons as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> now, like Stephen King, let's, since we're talking about him, do you have the same characters appear in numerous novels or numer numerous stories? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. So you have like the yeah. Brian Keene world. Oh yeah, I've got a I've got a whole mythos. There's a a Reddit community that I poke my head in once in a while. They're they're unraveling everything and piecing it all together. Um, and I've done that since day one. I I grew up reading a lot of Marvel comics, a lot of DC comics, where they all took place in the shared universe. And of course, yeah. today, you know, with the success of these movies, everybody knows what a shared universe means. But that wasn't always the case. But I, I knew since day one that everything I wrote was going to take place in, in the shared universe. Yeah. I love that. I love the, the Brian Keene world or the Stephen King world. Now you mentioned Brian Smith, you're working with him on suburban Gothic. Do you mm -hmm. like to collaborate or do you prefer to write alone? Depends on the project. Um, yeah. You know, I've done both. Uh, obviously the vast majority of my stuff is, is solo work. Uh, but you know, I, I collaborated with JF Gonzalez on six books and, um, and, you know, I've collaborated with Stephen Shrewsbury quite often, Jeff Cooper, uh, you know, my girlfriend, Mary San Giovanni. I think probably one of the best things I ever wrote was a short story with her. Um, you know, I, I like collaboration. It can be fun, um, but it, it, it depends on the story. For something like the Clickers books that I did with Jesus or, you know, Suburban Gothic that I just finished with Brian, those aren't meant to be these weighty, serious, socio-political commentary novels. You know, they're just they're just fun. Um, and in that case, it's it's a lot of fun to to make something with your friend. Um, whereas, you know, I'm working on a the final book in the Rising series. It's called The Fall, and it's it's going to be a big old doorstop of a novel. It's going to be about this thick when I'm done. Wait. So that's that's not something I would want to collaborate with someone on because obviously it's a pretty important novel to to my fans and I want to give them my all. Now how do you collaborate? Do you write something and Brian would write something and then you give it to him and he might edit what you had, then you edit what he has. So it seems seamless that you can't can't really tell this right. I could tell this is Brian's style of writing. This is you know Brian Smith. So is that how you do it? Or do it, you have a different way of it depends. It it Collaboration, just like writing, it's it's going to be different for everyone. Um, you know, with Jesus and I, because we were best friends and because our styles 
we're so similar. Um, and because we both, neither one of us plotted, we would both make shit up as we went along. We would literally just write a chapter, stop in mid sentence and send it to the other one. And the other one would pick it up and run with it, stop in mid sentence. And we just send it back and forth. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't a lot of editing because our voices are very, very similar. Uh, with Stephen Shrewsbury, who I've done three books and a short story with, he writes the entire first draft. And then I write the second draft, which might involve taking out things, putting in new things. Um, and then the two of us sit down. And for the third draft, we kind of meld everything together. Uh, with Brian, it was sort of the opposite of that. I started Suburban Gothic. It was supposed to be a solo novel. And, uh, you know, it, it's the subgenre of extreme horror, which I still enjoy reading, but I find as I get older, I have trouble as a writer getting myself in that headspace. Um, Brian doesn't have that problem still. <laughs> so I got about a quarter away through the novel and uh, I, I said, I'm, I'm struggling here. Uh, I said, uh, you know, if, if I pay you, will you come on and, and co-write this with me? And he's like, yeah, because I need money. So, <laughs> so I, I, I PayPal'd him some money and, and I sent him what I had done. And I sent him an outline of, you know, I, I'd like this to happen and this to happen. And eventually get us to point Z, make shit up, get us to point Z. So that's what he did. Um, and then he sent it back and then it became a process similar to what I do with, with shrews. You know, I took some of what he did and kept it. Some of what he did, I took out and added different things. And, you know, then we, we melded it together. Yeah. All right. What is your opinion on eBooks? I'm fine with them. I, you know, I, I read both. Um, yeah. Shit. I, uh, you know, I, I got my Kindle. And, uh, you know, I still read hard copy too. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're handy. I, the, the main thing I like about the Kindle is I can blow the font up, which is important at age 53. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, when Mary and I moved in together, our library consists of about 4,000 books, 4,000 hardcovers, paperbacks. Yeah. Um, and people are, always, always sending us more books and we're always buying more books and that's awesome. But you, there's just no room in the, uh, we got a big house, but there's still not room for all these books. So, you know, I, the Kindle's not my preferred method. I, I still love the feel, you know, I'm reading this Stephen Graham Jones book right now and I love the feel of it in my hand. I always will. Yeah, that's um, me too. Yeah, but I'm fine with ebooks. I'm fine with people reading however they want to read. If it's an audio book, if it's a an ebook, if it's a book, I don't give a shit. As long as they're reading and as as long as they're buying it and not pirating it. That's what I love about you that you're able to adapt. Some people say, "Nope, I'm only going to do this or I'm only going to do that," and it's like it's not going to change. It's only going to you know it might it's going to change because of technology for the better or for worse, whoever you look however you look at it, but. It's not only going to go back to hardcover or soft or paperback. There's always going to be the Kindle or something new if the Kindle goes out. So I love the fact that you can adapt to it and say, all right, you know what? Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll write here. And if I don't make not enough money from this, I'll do something else. And you balance it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we mentioned, you mentioned about writing stream horror because you're primarily known as a horror author. But as I said in the intro, You've written in many different genres, including sci-fi and westerns. Do you have a favorite? Is it? It's probably horror, but do you I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a horror fanboy. You know, always going to be a horror fanboy. Um, so that's always always going to be what I come back to. But I I do. You know, I I read a lot of crime. Um, I read a ton of westerns. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction too. Uh, not just. You know, like Hunter S. Thompson is, is my go-to comfort author. You know, when, when I'm having a shitty day, I, I go read his essays and my day is better. But, I, you know, I read like, uh, like right now, pull it up. You know, I'm, I'm also reading this nonfiction book, The Oxford History of the American West, which is probably boring to some people, but not to me. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, it's weird though. I thought of myself as a horror writer and I tried to do a crime novel early in my career. Uh, the third novel I did was a crime novel. It's called Terminal. And it had a little bit of a supernatural twist, but it was mostly just a crime novel. And it bombed. It, it was a stinker. And if I hadn't had a, another horror novel waiting in the wings, it, that, that novel could have killed my career right then and there. Yeah, so it was right. a long, I love that story. Uh, you know, it was a long time before yeah. I even considered playing in another genre. It wasn't until I was hanging out with Joe Lansdale. And you want to talk about somebody I look up to and admire who has been kind and gracious. Um, and don't get me wrong. I love my dad, but I, I Joe's not a, a father figure to me, but he's certainly an uncle. Yeah. Um, you know, but I was hanging out with him and uh, we were talking about, you know, these, these lost world stories like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Pellucidar and, the Warlord comic books from DC. And I said, I always wanted to write one of those, but I guess I, I guess I can't because I'm a horror writer. He looked at me and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I thought you were Brian motherfucking Keen. <laughs> I, I, looked at him. I said, well, I am that too. And he said, well, then who cares? You, you can write whatever the hell you want at this point. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, but it's, it's like, <laughs> I told Mary that night, <laughs> I, said, I think Joe gave me permission to write something that's not hard. She's like, you needed permission? I'm, I, I guess in my head I did. I needed somebody to say, go for it, you know? Um, so I, I did. Yeah, you know, that's, that's where uh, the, the Lost Level books came from. I've, I've done three of them now, and very, very popular books. Picked up a whole new audience that had never read my stuff before because they're sci-fi people. Um, so, yeah, I, you know. Write whatever you want to write. Write what. Write the book you want to write, and then worry about finding the audience for it. You know. I see. I love that. And Jonathan Mayberry um, comes to mind when you say that because I know when he first started, he kept on complaining because he loves the the legends on the werewolf and the vampires. He was writing books on that, and he goes, "They're always getting it wrong." Finally, his wife said, "Why don't you write the book that you want to read?" Yeah, and, that, and it's true. Yep. Like when I wrote my book, you know, I wrote it's, it's called Confessions of a Frenetic Mind, a little. <laughs> some self-promotion here but um i wrote five stories i said this, these are the stories that i would want to read and you know since i you know i just self-published it myself i'm having a great time and you know not making a lot of money on it i get every once in a while i'll get 25 cents in my uh, account from amazon but who cares i love it <laughs> um I first discovered you you mentioned leisure publishing so you started with them what happened with them i know it's probably a long story because it seems like probably with the summer of 2007, 2008 in Borders. I used to go there all the time when they existed. They had a whole leisure section. I enjoyed all the offers, like you, Edward Lee, Jay Gonzalez, or Jeff Gonzalez, um, Jack Ketchum. Then all of a sudden, bam, it was gone. Yep. Um, I mean, what happened is uh, the economic recession at that time hit them really, really hard, hit them harder than most publishers. And, uh, they owed me a lot of money and they had, they had always been good about paying me. Um, but they missed, what was it? Two royalty periods. I, I got paid uh, twice a year and they, they missed two royalty payments for me. Um, and I totaled it up. They owed me about $38,000. And it was enough that they did this conference call with their 20 biggest creditors and I was like creditor number 19. I actually, I was the only author to, to make it onto the call. Um, and to call into this thing, you had to have this private code, which I immediately shared with JF Gonzalez and Brian Smith and every other author I knew. So they're on eavesdropping. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'm on there. It's a lot of agents, uh, a lot of literary agencies, uh, a paper mill, a trucking company, who, who delivered for leisure. And I'm listening to their attorneys explain that they're going to operate as if they're filing for bankruptcy, but they're not going to file for bankruptcy. And, and they're going to liquidate the rights to these books that they own. And uh, they hop off to allow the creditors to talk amongst themselves if they'll accept this deal. And 
I'm listening, first of all, to these agents completely sell out their authors. You know, I, I hear one agent ask, ask them directly, how would you like me to spin this to my clients? So that was an eye opener. Um, but I, you know, I hear all this and they get to me and I'm like, uh, fuck this. I'm going to war. <laughs> I'm up the phone. Um, I had no idea what to do. And, uh, I had never met Dean Koontz in person, but I took his dog for a walk one time, which is a whole nother story. But I, I knew Dean through the Lehman family. I'd met his wife, I'd met his dog, had never met him in person, yeah. but I knew how to contact him. So I called him and uh, at the time he was, he was helping the Lehmans with, with Dick Lehman's literary estate. He, he wasn't overseeing it, but he was advising them. And I said, you know, Hey, you may be interested to hear this. This is what Leisure is going to do. Um, I don't know what to do. And he, he said, well, he said, you need to get your rights back. He, he says, you've got to get those rights back. I don't know how to tell you to do that. I've never heard of something like this, but you, you need to. So uh, Jesus Gonzalez and Brian Smith and Mary and myself and a bunch of other authors, we started a campaign. Um where we encouraged our readers not to buy our books and leisure's romance authors got on board their western writers got on board we started a boycott i ended up on cnn fox msnbc nobody wanted to talk to me about zombie novels for a change everybody wanted to talk to me about this and it was great and uh leisure finally capitulated they said if you'll shut up we'll give you your rights back. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I did. And, uh, you know, then they, then they went out of business. They were, they liquidated and, you know, it, it's a happy ending. Every, everybody that was published by them either got their rights back and, and were able to sell their books elsewhere or, you know, Amazon bought some of them out. Uh, it, it all worked out for everyone, but it was a, it was a tough six months there. And it left us. What's that? No, I'm sorry, did you ever get your royalties? That you never got my royalties, but I got the rights. And I would have happily paid twice the amount they owed me to get those rights back. So I was okay with it. You know, but it it left this huge gaping hole in the bookstore. And and most readers, you know, they, they probably didn't see it on the news because it wasn't a huge story. It was, you know, a little five-minute story. Yeah. Um, so they, they didn't know what happened. They just knew that suddenly they weren't seeing horror books in the stores anymore. Yeah, I, I missed it. I, it was that one summer, like 2007, 2008. And I was, I went to borders every day, picking out a new book from leisure. I mean, they had an entire section full of leisure books, yep. but I'm, I'm glad that things worked out for you and everybody else. And speaking of your novels, I want to talk about some of your novels because one of them, it's one of my favorites is ghoul. Was that autobiographical? Oh, hell yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I was, you know, I said it in 1984. I was a little older than the protagonists of the novel in 1984. In 1984, I was a, a junior in high school. Um, and the, the kids in the book are all middle schoolers at that time. But uh, other than that, absolutely autobiographical. Um, you know, I was, I was Timmy, you know, yeah. and Nolan Gould, of course, who everyone knows from Modern Family, you know, he, he, uh, he stole the show on Modern Family. He played Timmy in the movie and, you know, being on set, hanging out with him. Um, and then, you know, the movie premieres at Sundance. And he and I are hanging out. Mary commented. She's like, she's like, it's so weird. And I said, what? She goes, I know he's an actor, but it, it's like watching you hang out with a kid version of yourself. <laughs> like your little mini me. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, we're like throwing snowballs at the paparazzi who are trying to take his picture. Yeah. You know, we had a good time, but it sounds like it. Yeah. But yeah, that, that the movie, they, you know, they made some changes and, and they had to, I understand why they made the changes. Uh, so the movie, not so, not so autobiographical. Uh, but the book, absolutely, yeah. Didn't your father have a strong reaction to that, either that book or movie? I think when you read it, you started... To the book, he, yeah. uh, you know, and I want people to understand, you know, the, the book is about abuse and the different forms that abuse takes. Um, I don't consider my father abusive. Uh, I, I can't stress that enough. My dad 
grew up in a very abusive household where he watched his mother crack his father over the head with a frying pan. Um, you know, and then, then he went to Vietnam and came back with what we now know was PTSD. But back in the seventies, we didn't, we didn't know what PTSD was. Um, my dad was not abusive, but my dad absolutely had anger issues. And, uh, I was telling ghost stories to my little sister and her friends and I freaked them out and she come home crying because of the ghost stories I told and my dad snapped and he, uh, he sat me down. He got my comic book collection, which I was 12. There was nothing on earth. I loved more than my comic book collection, except maybe my BMX mongoose bike. Uh, but he, he sat me down. He's in front of that collection and he ripped up, every single issue. And uh, I wrote about it in the novel. And I had no idea my dad was reading my books. And he, I get a call one night at like one in the morning. And I, you know, I'm thinking somebody died. Why the hell else is my dad calling me at one o'clock? And he's crying. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, somebody really did die. And he's like, did, did I ever apologize for ripping up your comic books? Um, I'm like, no, what are, you, what are you talking about? Well, I just read your book and I got to that scene. <laughs> so we were, we were able to heal from it. But uh, yeah, I mean, everything that happened in that book happened in real life, except that we didn't have a ghoul living next door in the cemetery. But we had some real ghouls in that neighborhood. Now, another novel that I loved is called Castaways. The two main protagonists were named Richard and Sal from the Howard no. Stern Show. Howard optioned the rights for that movie. Whatever happened? Howard didn't. Um, he didn't? Oh, I thought he did. No, he gave, it, he gave, it, he gave Sal and Richard their blessing uh, to appear, you know, as themselves in the movie. Okay. Um, but, yeah, Howard didn't actually option. It was optioned. The rights expired, uh, as they often do. I've, I'm lucky enough just about everything I've written has been optioned at one time or another. Yeah. But not a lot of it gets made. Um, but you still get paid for that, right? Oh yeah. You still get paid. So I'm not complaining, but yeah, I, you know, I was a fan of Richard's and he was a fan of mine. And, I love uh, death. I mean, I know it was yeah. one of the bands he was in. Then ice earth is the other band. He's a great drummer. He was, he's, well, he's one of the greatest drummers yeah. in modern music. And, you know, as a as a Stern fan going all the way back to DC 101, you know, when Richard tried out to be on the show and he'd send in those those phony phone calls, it was just it's a master class in, in comedy. So, you know, we we admired each other. Um, and when I was writing Castaways, I, I said, Hey, can I put you and Sal in the book? He's like, Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> I never met him, but he seems like such a great guy. Listening to him on the radio, he's, he's just he's, so, so down to earth, so genuine. You know, yeah. Richard is, he's one of those guys that he's a small town blue collar guy who's had some success, but has never forgotten where he came from. He's yeah. still that small town blue collar guy. And those are the people I love, you know. Well, it's funny because years ago, I used to have Howard On Demand. When he first went to satellite radio, he had his own TV show. And they went to Richard's house and had his parents on there. Uh, it was one of the best episodes I ever saw. Hey, Rich, look what I just killed. You want to eat a possum? <laughs> <It was> hilarious. <laughs> I've, met his, I've met his cousin. Um, his cousin used to go to a, a convention that used to have me as a guest every year. I got to know him pretty well, too. And, and uh, you know, he, he's also another down-to-earth guy I, I think the whole family must be that way you know just yeah. just down to earth salt of the earth people so much like my own kin you know yeah well you mentioned uh conventions it's not really a convention but i want to talk about something that you're involved with scares that care yeah because you're on the board of directors yep and i went to the one in new york pennsylvania two or three years ago i had the best time and you do such great work you have different authors there. You have some great interviews. You have panels, and you raise money for people who have cancer, who are burned. So, man, first of all, you know, thank you very much for all the great work you've done with that. And uh, it's, you, you make it fun. That's what's so great. And there's I'm just, hours. I'm, I'm one small part of that machine. That's all. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was uh, it was founded by uh, 
a Baltimore City detective, Joe Ripple. Um, his his partner's daughter died. She was a, a young child. And, you know, Joe was a, a big fan of the genre, um, an amateur indie filmmaker. And, you know, he looked around and he said, we've got all these conventions and all these events. Why don't we put that energy to good use and start a charity? And, uh, you know, he got myself on board and some other people on board. Uh, Kane Hodder, of course, who plays Jason in the Friday the 13th movies. We, we partnered up with him for his burn charity. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess we've been going over a decade now. Um, and, you know, the charity has grown. The charity has helped people. Um, I love it. That's the one thing I would never walk away from, I don't think. Um, it, it's, you know, writing books is fun. But this is an opportunity to genuinely help people. And, and don't get me wrong. I understand that, that my books can help people. Like, it can help people get through study hall or get through their lunch break or, you know, maybe they're stuck in some loveless marriage and they can, they can escape with one of my books. Okay. But when you have somebody who's, whose child is dying of cancer or somebody who's been burned um, or, you know, a, a, a woman fighting breast cancer and you're able to actually hand them money, hand them a check and, and know goddamn well exactly how, how, that check will change their lives. It's indescribable. It's an indescribable feeling. And, and to know that you did it as an ambassador of the horror genre is even better, you know? Well, I get to see it firsthand in York, Pennsylvania, where you handed the check and just the tears streaming down her face from how happy you made her and how grateful she was. Yeah, it's, it's very, uh, it was very heartwarming. And you've, according to what I read, you've raised close to or maybe over $30,000 for everybody? Uh, a minimum every year. We, uh, you know, the, the charity, we, we pick three host families every year. Um, and our, our minimum goal is to give each of those host families $10,000 to, to use however they need to. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we do a different, you know, we do a couple conventions. Uh, we do a, a telethon every year, which, which you were at. Um, and we've done other things, you know, we've done like crab feasts and we do auction sign stuff and, uh, you know, but yeah, every, every year it gets bigger and bigger, um, to the point where I think the next board of directors meeting, we're, we're probably going to have to talk about expanding our outreach and, and helping even more people. What I love is that you, even with the pandemic, you were able to continue it because you did it, you um, did a live stream. Yeah. So it was on YouTube and you were, I watched a lot of it and it was great. Thanks. We're doing uh we're doing another one next month actually for Halloween. So. Oh really? Yep. Yeah. You know what I'm mad about? Cause around that time I've seen you there so many times at the Merrimack in Haverhill, Mass, the Merrimack of yep. Book festival. It's like, obviously they're not going to have that. I'm guessing. Um, They're doing an online version actually. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, you've helped out so many people. So on June 5th, 2018, people came to your aid helping raise money for your medical costs. What happened? <laughs> um, we, uh, we had just had a flood, one of those once in a hundred year floods. And my ex-wife's property just got just leveled. I mean, just destroyed her. Her house was still standing, but you know, she had a two acres of land out back and it just, it leveled everything. And, uh, her boyfriend at the time, he was working on cleaning up the debris and uh, he got injured and she was worried about him. And, and I told her, I said, you know what, you, you help him, I'll come over and I'll finish up your, your property for you. So uh, had a big fire pit going and, you know, I was getting all the trees that had washed up and railroad ties and all this other stuff. I was throwing them on the fire pit and, uh, it was the first day of summer vacation and I sent our son into her house to get me a, a bottle of water. And uh, I went to throw some more debris on. I had used gasoline to start the fire about 45 minutes before. Um, and I, I guess to this day, I'm not for sure, but I guess I had gotten gasoline on my, my arm. Um, but, you know, I turned towards the fire, 
wind shifted, flame shot toward me, and I looked, and my arm was on fire. Yeah. And, and I, <laughs> I, to this day, I don't know why, but I kind of raised my hand to look, and then I caught up here. Um, now, I knew enough to stop, drop, and roll. And, you know, I was standing in about this much flood water, so that was easy. Um, but I, I came up and uh, I thought my face had got the worst. It turned out my face was only second degree. It was, uh, and it was all up here. Um, I didn't think my arm was that bad, but I'm, I'm walking up to my ex-wife's house and I'm thinking, shit, I don't have health insurance. All right, don't panic. It's gonna be okay. Get it cleaned up, get it disinfected, put some Neosporin on it. You're gonna be fine. Um, my ex-wife and my boy come out of the house. They had heard me scream. I, I didn't even realize I had screamed. And they looked at me and their expressions told me everything. And I said, uh, I said, don't tell me how bad my face is. And uh, my ex-wife just breaks into tears. And my, my son, <laughs> little me, he says, uh, dad, it's not your face. Your arm's coming off. Okay. And I looked down and sure enough, uh, you know, you ever see a candle melt? Yes. From here down, it the skin was just it was just coming away, like just dripping down like a candle. I could see inside my elbow parts that should never be exposed to the light, and I said, "Fuck, I don't have health insurance." Um, and I told her not to call me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> and, and she she's like, "You idiot! I'm calling an ambulance." <laughs> and I knew I was going into shock. I knew if I sat down, I was probably going to lose consciousness. And so I, I kept walking, kept reassuring my son it was going to be okay. Paramedics got there. Um, you know, they got me stabilized. She called Mary. Mary showed up. Um, went to the emergency room and they cleaned me up, but they told me, they said, we, we can't help you. There's three hospitals in the East Coast that can help you. Lehigh Valley's the closest. And I said, all right, well, let's go there. And uh, they took me there and I was in for, I guess, uh, a week, a little longer. They, they gave me this stuff. They didn't have to do graphs or anything. They gave me this experimental stuff called Superthel. It was invented to, to cover sucking chest wounds on the battlefield. But what they found out is they adhere it to burn victims and your skin, it, it basically provides a temporary skin until your skin grows back. Um, it's sort of like cheesecloth. Your skin will grow over it and through it and around it. Um, so, you know, I lived, uh, but yeah, it was an exorbitant amount of money. And, uh, while I was in the first emergency room, you know, in shock, hopped up on morphine, uh, I called author Stephen Kozanowski, he's a young author who's in charge of my literary estate, should I die? And I told him, hey, there's a chance I might be dying. Here's where you find everything. I said, i also start a GoFundMe because I don't want Mary to have to pay for my funeral. <laughs> so <laughs> he and Joe Ripple of Scares the Care very wisely decided instead of starting a, a funeral fund for me, they would start a medical fund for me. On, and uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm Still can't talk about people's generosity without choking up. Um, you know, people people came through for me, and, and not just there. Um, you know, like uh, I know Stephen King's Haven Foundation; they offered to help if we needed it. Luckily, we didn't need it, so they were able to help other people. Um, you know, Keith Giffen, my, my one of my favorite comic creators of all time, I, Justice League and Rocket Raccoon. He called me in the burn ward. And he's like, you know, what, what the hell's this GoFundMe for? And I'm like, well, I'm in the burn ward. He's like, you need money? Fuck that. I've got Rocket Raccoon money. How much do you need? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people were super generous. They stepped up. Um, and, you know, so that gives me absolute clear sight into – when scares of care helps somebody, exactly what we're doing for them. You yeah. Know? Well, that was the point I wanted to make is you've done so much for so many people. And it's so great that when you needed help 
everybody stepped up and said, you know what, here, let me help you out, Brian. You're always there for us. We're here for you now. And right. you, have, you have great fans. Well, and that's what I think. I think a lot of fans don't realize, you know, um, yeah, your, your favorite author or your favorite actor or your favorite filmmaker, they might be successful. Um, but the vast majority of us do not have health insurance, even with the Affordable Care Act. We're that, we're that group that doesn't get included in that. Um, so yes, you can, you can make a good living in this industry until something like that happens and then you're screwed, you know? Um, and I see it happen time and time and time again with, with filmmakers and authors who I look up to, um, you know, especially as they get older. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good to know that the tribe has your back when something like that happens years ago I interviewed Jeff Strand he told me the same thing he said before he can quit his day job the one thing he had to make sure that he had was health insurance yep and we, we actually talked about what happened to you he goes I just needed health insurance before I could say you know what I quit and I could start writing full-time so yeah I you don't realize because I'm 53 years old so we're about the same age and it wasn't until recently I've been luckily healthy so far for the most part but you don't realize until you're older how important health insurance is yeah yeah so so, well, I'm glad you're all right, and I'm glad you had such a, I guess I can't really say quick recovery, but I'm glad you recovered so well. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. scarring, I mean, there's very little scarring up here. My 12-year-old likes to to pick up my head and point out the scars to me, <laughs> um, but you, you don't really notice it unless I've been out in the sun. My arm, I notice it. Mary tells me she doesn't, but I know she's just being kind. I I, I notice it a lot on my arm, but... Yeah, for the most part, I got lucky. I've I've been to burn wards. I've talked to burn victims. Um, I lucked out, and I can't stress that enough. Um, but you know, I still that's it's what going on three years now, and I I still have physical pain associated with it. I probably always will. Um, I still have trouble regulating my temperature. I'm either too hot or too cold depending on what's, what the weather's like. Um, so, but you know, I still, I'm, I'm very lucky. There's a lot of other people in a lot worse shape. Well, I want to go back to scares that care for one more time, because the one in New York, Pennsylvania, there was a band that played and they were great. It was called discipline theory. Yeah. And they did a rocking version of the backstreet boys. I had to get up and mosh. It's just something that had to be done. <laughs> but I wanted to bring that up because just very recently, one of the band members, Jose Castillo, died. Yep. And uh, I just wanted to say RIP Jose, because I met both of them. Great group, great bunch of guys. And this was also very touching as well. You were, I, was, I heard you mention this. One of the last things that he did was to donate money at your latest streaming telethon. Same day he died. Um, yep. He was, I, I, I talked to Eddie, the, the lead singer. Um, you know, he was, Jose was in the hospital, sick. And from the hospital, he was listening to the, the telethon we were doing for Scares of Care, and he made a donation. And I remember seeing his donation come through. I didn't know he was sick. I, mean, I was oh, hey, Jose, I got, I got to email him later and thank him. And he, he passed away like two hours after we finished, you know. I was shocked to hear that. Because, yeah. I mean, but they were, they were a great band, and uh, I feel sorry for Jose and everything. Two very and solid family. dudes, man. Yeah. Very yeah. solid guys. Eddie will probably watch this. So, Eddie, what's up, man? Love hey, for you. You guys are great. And sorry for your loss. Now, back to you, Brian. Okay. What is Letters from the Labyrinth? Oh, that's just my uh, my weekly newsletter. Um, yeah, I, like every other public figure, I have to use social media. You know, you're other than Bentley Little, I, I can't think of a public figure not using social media. Um, but I, I like, you know, I, you and I were the first generation of the internet and, and I miss the, the personalization of newsletters. Remember when newsletters were like the thing? I love them. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like doing a newsletter every week and I, I like taking my time and putting in my thoughts on stuff and whatever I want to talk about that week. That's what I talk about. And, uh, you know, it's got like, I think like 3000 people that read it every week. So uh, apparently some other people miss newsletters as well. Well, I have to say, I love it because 
it lets you – I think um, what impressed me the most is when I went to uh, Scares That Care is that there were so many people there that were like family. They weren't just fans. They weren't just friends. Everybody said, oh, my God, Brian's the best. One time I, one, somebody was telling me how you needed a place to stay and you stopped over and stayed at his house. And it's like everybody was talking about like how great you are. I mean, I could see like – and you know almost everybody by name. I met you one or two times like, hey, Rich, how are you? I mean, so I think this is also a great way for your fans to feel connected with what you're doing. And they know almost what you're doing on a you know, weekly basis. It's a, it's a great thing. I read it all the time. I love it. I'll tell you, I, uh, I, the one thing with this pandemic, obviously the, the worst thing about the pandemic, and my, my son's mother is extremely high risk. So she and my youngest son and Mary and myself, we've all been living together in this house. And it's great. The girls are friends. We all get along fine. Um, but, you know, we want to protect her. So we don't socialize with anyone else. But the worst thing about the pandemic is the fact that my son can't socialize with his friends in person. But other than that, the worst thing for me is that I can't go interact with my readers and my fans in person. Like you just mentioned, I love being able to do that. I love hearing what people are reading, what they thought of the last book, what they want me to write next. I need that feedback personally. I do. And I can't invite it online because then I wouldn't get shit else done all, all day. I'd just be reading people's responses all day. Yeah. Um, so I, I need the physical, you know. Um, but it's work trying to remember everyone's name. And I, I've probably gotten some people's names wrong over the years. And if I have, I apologize. Mary and I actually have a trick. If She, she actually has a condition. I, I don't remember the medical name for it. But she'll remember... Uh, names but she can't remember people's faces like she can meet somebody seven times and not remember their face and you know i suck at remembering people's names but i'm very good with faces so that's me you know we have a thing where if we're together and a fan approaches hey brian and mary you know if i don't know their <laughs> if i can't remember their name i'll go to mary and i'll go have you ever met <laughs> And she'll go, hi, I'm married. But it doesn't work because the people, yeah, hi, I'm Bob. I've met you like seven times before. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. It's like, oh, it's nice to meet you. Rich, I've met you six times. You were the best man at my wedding. <laughs> I, I am horrible with names. I'm hor And actually, hor not so bad with faces, but there's times where, yeah, it's nice to meet you. And like, Rich. I see, I see all the time. So I definitely understand, but it's great that you two can feed off of each other. You know, you know what's, you know, what's really cool. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big concert goer. I love going to hear live music and yeah. you know, like 10, 15 years ago, I'd go see Springsteen or Iron Maiden or Ice T, you know, cause I'm eclectic. I like all kinds of music and people my age would have their, have their kids there. You know, it'd become like a generational show. And I'm finding the same thing when I do signings or when I do, you know, at the bookstore or when I do a convention appearance, people who I've been signing for for 20 years, whose names I do remember because I've been yeah, signing yeah. for them for 20 years, yeah. they're bringing their kids now and their kids are starting to read these books. And that's the fucking coolest thing in the world, man. Yeah, it is. No, I, I love it. Now, what is the Buzz Book Expo? Oh, that's, uh, that's something Mary cooked up. I'm not involved with that at all, um, other than I let her use my YouTube channel for it. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure what it was, because that's how, that's how not involved with it. I, uh, I think it was uh, something they did where publishers, because, you know, publishers don't have the convention circuit to rely on right now either. It was a way for them to get their books in front of readers, let them know what they had coming up, et cetera. But yeah, I, I don't know. You got to have Mary on your show. Ask her. Okay. I will have her as a guest sometime. Some, a Claus Corner exclusive. Mary St. Giovanni coming soon to the Claus Corner. Go. Um, question for you. So I interviewed Owen King, and one of the things he said was that, you know, he'd come home from school when he was a kid, and his mother would be in one room writing. His father would be in the other room writing. He found writing very, very lonely until he discovered, he goes, you know what? I have a whole world inside of my head. He goes, I don't know why I thought, because at first he didn't want to become a writer because he thought it was 
you know, too isolated for him. It was too much of an isolation. Did you ever find that at first or did you enjoy the creative aspect of it? No, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Always enjoyed it. However, I can absolutely empathize with what Owen's saying because uh, I see it in my own, my own son. You know, he's 12. Um, he lives in a house where during the day I'm writing and Mary's writing and his mom, she's writing. Now she, she's doing a very different kind of writing. She's writing things for, for corporations, but you know, she's writing. Um, and during the summer, particularly during the pandemic, he had to entertain himself all day. Um, and what I found interesting is instead of writing, it's, it's animation and filmmaking for him. Um, and I, I think it's because he sees, much like Owen, he sees writing as this solitary thing and it, it's very lonely. Yeah. So he's doing animation and, and film and he puts them up on his YouTube channel and he's got like 70 subscribers, you know, and wow, right? he's getting instant feedback from people his own age, you know, his own target yeah. audience. Um, I, so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of merit, and a lot of truth to what Owen's saying there. Let's do a little promotion for uh, your son. What is the YouTube channel? How can people subscribe to it? Fire Lord HD. That's all one word, all lowercase. Fire, like what burned his dad. Lord, like what he should grow up to be. <laughs> HD is in high def. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, I mean, I, I may be biased. I think it's pretty freaking awesome. But uh, I made a cameo in one of his cartoons. So. Right, you got to check it out. Because he is formerly known as Dungeon Master. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, I learned very early on with the publication of The Rising that there's a certain element of the public out there that you don't want to let into your life. Um, you know, I've had people show up at my home. Uh, I've had people mail me all kinds of atrocious things. You know, I, I've, I've had all sorts of creative death threats. Um, so we never wanted his real name out there until he was old enough to make that decision for himself. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and talking to, to others who, who have grown up with parents like that, uh, you know, my friends, Keith and Casey Lansdale, uh, Joe Hill, of course. Um, you know, I, we absolutely made the right decision in that regard. Um, he bristles at it sometimes because he's a teenager now. Uh, but he knows it's the one rule that mom and dad and Mary, all three concur. We catch you using your real name and that's it. We're pulling the plug on your YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, now he's Fire Lord HD. I love it. So check it out on YouTube. We're going to have that in post where it's running across the screen, how you can subscribe to his channel. So Brian, what advice would you have to up and coming writers, especially now in this new age of writing? With um, I mean, it's, it's better minds than me have said it, but they say it because it's true. Write every day and read every day. Now, I understand people may be in situations where they can't write every day. And that's okay. Um, but you need to get on some kind of schedule. Maybe you write every Wednesday or maybe, you, you know, the, the more you write, the better you're going to be. So writing every day is ideal. But if you, if you can't get on a schedule and, and there's no such thing as I don't have time to write. Um, you need to make the time, you know, Bev Vincent still has a day job. He gets up an hour early every morning. Uh, Michael Lamo, who did a, a series of horror novels for leisure back in the day, he had a day job in the garment district. He would take the train from Connecticut to Manhattan every day. And he'd write on the train. I don't know how the fuck he did that. I know. But, you know, he wrote like eight or nine novels on the train. Um, that is impressive. Yeah. You know, maybe you get up an hour early. Maybe you go to bed an hour later. Um, I get it. Every, you, you have kids. You have significant others. And, and all of these things are important. And absolutely, you have to give them attention. But you also have to give attention to your writing. Well, another one. I met John Grisham, and he said the same thing. He was an attorney or is an attorney and he'd wake or he'd wake up early in the morning, start writing, then go to work and then come home. And then once again, write, he'd write at least one page a day. That was his yep. thing that he told me. And it can be done. You don't have to write 20 pages a day or one page a day. And then, you know, a hundred days, you have a hundred pages. 
I didn't quit my day job until Dark Hollow came out. You know, uh, Terminal and City of the Dead, I wrote those novels simultaneously. Um, and, and I still had a day job. Now, at that point, I was lucky enough it was a part-time job. It was four hours a day yeah. on the loading docks. But still, I was balancing that and writing two novels. You, you, you have to make the time to do it. You want it to be done, you can make sure it's done. Instead of going home and turning on the TV for a couple hours before you go to bed, Right. Yeah. So I agree with you. Somebody made a great point. They said the only unpublished novel is from somebody that stopped too soon. Yep. If they want it done, they can get it done. I agree. And um, as we mentioned before, you're always involved in several projects at the same time. So what's next and where can people find you? Uh, well, they can find me at briankeen.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-K-E-E-N-E.com. Um, what's next? Let me look up here at the whiteboard. Uh, <laughs> well, Suburban Gothic, as I said, that'll be coming out end of the year. Um, and early next year, there'll be a novel called The Seven that comes out. Um, and I'm very limited in what I can say about them, but I have two projects next year that as a fan of this genre, I'm very excited about. One of them involves... Uh, Joe R. Lansdale's fictional town of Mud Creek. If you're at all a Lansdale fan, you've probably read at least one or two novels or stories that took place in Mud Creek. Um, I'm working on something involving Mud Creek. And the other one, again, I, I'm very limited in what I can say, uh, but I'm working on something ah. that involves a young lady named Gwendy and a town called Castle Rock and some of the surrounding environs around Castle Rock. Like, uh, you know, there's another town near Castle Rock called Salem's Law. And uh, again, I, I, I'm very limited in what I could say, but uh, it's the dream gig of a lifetime. <laughs> I cannot fucking wait uh, to get to work on it and, and for people to, to read it when it's done. Can, can you say if it's a collaboration or are you writing alone? It's a collaboration, but not how you think. Okay. Well, I know where you're going with this. I don't know what, what, what you're, I mean, where it's going to end, but I'm very happy with what you just said, and I cannot wait to see the finished product. <laughs> so you have a lot of great things coming up. Brian, so great having you on the show. I appreciate you coming on to the Claws Corner. You're a great guest, an excellent writer, and you've, oh, you've entertained me for at least 20 years. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. Anytime. And, and I will let Mary know that, that she's going to be in the hot seat next. Oh, so. She has to be. <laughs> I want to find out about the book expo. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, then, Rich. As, as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that wraps up another episode of the Claws Corner, the Zoom edition. I would like to thank my guest, the extremely talented and the brutally honest, Mr. Brian Keene. I would hey. also like to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. Hey.